Dzień dobry bardzo. Um, so, as uh, Sally said, my name is Matthew Henry, uh, but people know me as P01 online. Uh, you can find me in yeah, various places, Twitter, GitHub, and so on. Um, but yeah, also most people know me because I'm into code golfing and creative coding. Code golfing is the, the art of taking a source code of uh, the application size to some ridiculously small sizes, um, down to hundreds of bytes or dozens of bytes. And creative coding is a practice of making art with code. So this is what I like to do. And the things you see in the background now are some of my productions. They range from four kilobytes, one kilobyte, and down to 64 bytes. They all have some form of sound, animations, interaction, and yeah, just range from yeah, about 4K down to 64 bytes, all in HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Uh, but actually, I come from the demo scene. Uh, the demo scene is a, like a subculture that grew up from the cracking scene and just tries to push the boundaries and the, the artistic and technical limits of a given platform. And this is what I try to do. So today we'll talk about demo reel and tiny JavaScript demos. The thing you see in the background is about 900 bytes, by the way. Just this crazy thing spinning around. Um, so to go through the talk today, uh, there will be two parts, some tips and tricks and some live coding. So hopefully we'll go fine. <laughs> Um, let's start. Basically, to, to do these things, you just need to have a creative mindset. You just need to know the standards and abuse them and have a visual understanding of mathematics. Don't get, don't get scared about big formulas and this kind of things. It's, it's, okay. <laughs> it's okay. You just need to understand basically how they work or how things move around and how things relate to each other, and then you'll be fine. You'll be able to create anything you want. Um, when you do small, uh, small demo, small JavaScript animations, there's no room for frameworks and libraries. You, you just need to solve the problem you, you try to do and do just that. Don't waste any space with libraries and frameworks. And as much as possible, you should try to use a single visual primitive and one formula to drive the visuals and the sound together so that things stay in sync and that you have nice things. Um, so this thing visually is just a bunch of triangles and the formula that drives the explosions also drives the sound for it. Can you hear me? Okay. And now? Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, so to do animations, you will probably want to play a little bit with trigonometry. It's just a barbaric word to talk about things that move smoothly around circles and smooth uh, shapes, smooth curves like sinus, cosinus. So for that, you will need to use pi a lot and fractions of pi. And if you try to do very small things, you will need to use very short versions of fractions of pi. So these numbers, 1, 8, 11, 22, 44, are approximations of fractions of pi, like pi over 3 is very close to 1. But 8 is very close to pi over 2 plus 1 full circle. 11 is the same, but backwards and so on. Uh, so when you aim for very, very small sizes, it can save some very precious bytes. Uh, talking about numbers, um, you must have heard about the IEEE 754 standard, which specifies how numbers are represented in JavaScript and many other languages. Uh, they are basically represented in binary as composition of powers of twos and fractions of powers of twos. Uh, which means that in JavaScript and many other languages, when you do 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1, you don't end up with 0 0.3 as you would expect, but 0 0.3 0, 0, 0, 4, which is completely fine according to a spec, and that's okay. Uh, but when you do loops, when you do a loop from uh, 0 to 10 with an increment of 0 0.1, uh, the loop does not end up exactly at 10. It ends at 10.091. And that can be okay, uh, but if you use an increment that is a fraction of power of two, then things are a lot better um, because all the numbers along this loop can be expressed exactly. And if you aim for a very, very small size, um, it gives some nice properties because then you can use strict equality on integer values and that allows you to combine two loops into one just because of that fact, because you use the standard and all the numbers are correct. Um, Again, if you aim for very small sizes, yes, six template literals have some very nice things. Um, before, when you wanted to concatenate some variables and strings together to build some markup, for instance, and animate things, 
you just do what we see in the first line of code, so just build a string and append things together. With uh, template literals, it's a lot shorter. You see, we have three bytes here. Um, but there's also a nice thing in, uh, in uh, yes, template literals that is called tag templates, uh, which basically means that you can have a function that takes a single argument that is a string. And you can just omit the parentheses, and you're good. You save two bytes. Uh, similarly, you can abuse function arguments. And this is very useful in WebGL. So in WebGL, you often need to pass integer uh, numbers, basically, to your functions. And often, you need to pass a 0 or 1 or something. If you pass undefined or nothing, uh, it will throw. But if you pass null, it gets cast to 0. And what returns null is a function that returns nothing. So if you have different calls, like at the bottom, uh, you have one function that doesn't do anything really, and you need to pass 0. You can just nest the calls, and you can just nest and nest and nest, and then you save more bytes. Um, to do these small demos also, you would probably want to do some music. And there's two ways on the web. There's the audio element, which is very basic. So just a new audio element, and you just load the sound and plays it, and that's about it. And there's also the web audio API, which is much more complex. It lets you build a graph of music nodes and oscillators and gain nodes and so on. Um, All good? OK. So, so there's basically these two ways to, to use and do audio on the web. Um, so here we have an example of using the, uh, the audio element. First two lines build a header of a WAV file. The two lines in the middle create a sound buffer and append it to a string. And the last two lines, we basically load it and play it. And yeah, that's how you do with the uh, audio element. With the web audio API, it's relatively small as well. Uh, you just create an audio context, a script processor, you connect it, and then you, an audio process. So whenever you need a new sound buffer, a new small sound buffer, you just populate the channel data and dot. And these two techniques are about 180 bytes. Um, and to build sound with that, you, you have to code, to programmatically code your instrument. So if you want to do a hi-hat, it's basically a noise with an exponential decay. So the first line, you see it's just noise. Like and the second uh, line does a big exponential decay from 1 to 0, and then just And that's what we get. That's how you build sounds. Um, you will need a render loop for your animation. And if you're a good citizen, you just use request animation frame. You have a function, a tick function, and you just call it again. Um, if you're bad. <laughs> You will use set interval. If you're worse, you will use set interval with a string. Um, but if you're really naughty and you do sound with, you can actually hit two birds with one stone. In the audio process event, you can do the, the, well, the sound generation and also the, the visuals. It's, uh, it, saves, it saves some bytes, really. <laughs> it's really useful. Um, and you will be, of course, you'll be playing with colors, and it's very tempting to use HSL to change the colors over time. But the problem is that it's very slow in web browsers. Uh, it takes a lot of time to parse and to yeah, convert to RGB. So what you can do, it said, is you can deconstruct that. HSL is basically moving the RGB components along the color wheel. So you just set RGB, and you set the, the three components to shift along a circle uh, by 2 pi over 3, which is very close to 2 and 4 over the next part. And that's a, an order of magnitude faster. So to sum it up, it's about having a creative mindset, about abusing the standards and getting a visual understanding of mathematics and not being scared of them. Yep. So now it's time for live coding. Um, yep. Hmm. <laughs> no. <laughs> So, here. Um, because I don't have so much time, I prepared a bit of boilerplate. So, here, uh, the first lines at the top, we have a, a canvas where it says in full size, and we load an image, and on load, we get the context. Set the height of this canvas to 576. 
uh, respect the aspect ratio of the viewport and we set the values. And we have a small render loop here. So today I would like to do some kind of particles that follow a vector field. A vector field is basically what you see in the weather forecast where you see maps of, uh, with tiny arrows that follow the wind. So I would like to do these kind of things. And with a bit of sound on playing with a logo of front ends. So let's go. So first we need to set our particles. So we'll just say that we want let's say four thousand ninety six. Uh, we'll do P a particle. So we'll just get random coordinates inside our inside our canvas. And we will set that as the x and y zero as the origin coordinates of a particle. And then we need to draw them in the render loop. Um, we can clear this as well. In can when you set the width or height of a canvas, it basically resets it. It's like just reset the width and height and just clears it all. So here we clear the canvas like that. And to draw the particles, we just do a for each and the, and the particles. And we can set the fill style to whatever. Uh, fill right. So we will draw the x and y at the x and y coordinate, a tiny, tiny rectangle. But we don't have x and y coordinates. We only have the origin so far. So what we'll do is we say, OK, let's take the x coordinate if we had one already, or we fall back to the previous one, to the, uh, to the origin coordinate. And the same in y. So now, of course, we have nothing. Yes, that's a good, very good point. Thank you very much. Yeah, so now we just draw our particles. And they are not moving, so it's not really nice. So we will just do that. So to move, we just need to do the x and y coordinates. We just add the velocity in x and y. But we don't have a velocity in x and y already, so we'll just do, we will define it. And so again, we will check the previous value. Uh, what we can do is we will move them from the center on out. So we just do the position in x minus the center in x and the same in y. So you can probably see that this thing is going to go really fast and just explode. Uh, so to solve this problem, we can compute the length of this velocity vector, which is you know, Vx and Vy. And we can divide the velocity by this length vector to make, it make sure that it's not bigger than 1. So now things should move a lot slower. slower. Perfect. Um, so. It's nice, but it would be a little bit nicer if uh, we could actually um, have like a trail of these things. So we can do, um, we will draw the background color at a low opacity on top of that so that it, it should leave a trail of a particle. So uh, we can set the global alpha to a very small value. And then fill style, our background color was 201. We can set. Uh, fill the whole right rectangle on the whole resolution of it. And so we get this, we get a nice trail. But it could look even nicer if we actually uh, draw the particles in lighter mode so that we accumulate the color so it looks even more shiny. Uh, so to do that, we just use the global composite operation of the canvas. So the default mode is source over, which basically draws over the source. And to set the 
particles in lighter. That's how it is. So things are a little bit brighter. Not so much. Um, but you see that the particles go out of the screen, and yeah, so we should actually fix that and make sure that when they go out, we bring them back in position. So if the x uh, is lower than zero, or the y is lower than zero, or that the x is greater than the resolution in x, or the y is exceeds the bottom of our canvas, uh, then we need to actually bring back the, uh, the particles. So for that, we also need to reset the velocity. And we can do also reset the, uh, the x and y. And because here, uh, if there's no value or it's null, then we fall back to the, to the original. So now we should see the particles that reach the edge, we, we get back at their initial position. It's not so nice because you see that it makes uh, some kind of diamond shape that comes back into it. So what we can do is uh, we can define if we want to use a new coordinate. And just for a few particles, we will just like start fresh. So we say, OK, if a random number is lower than, say, 5%, 0 0.05, uh, we will use a new coordinate. So we can say, if use new, we'll do we will reset the coordinates, and otherwise we just use the, uh, the original. So we should get a bit less of this diamond shape sinking in. Uh, but yeah, I said that uh, I wanted to play a bit with the logo of, uh, of Frontend, so we'll do that now. You see that at first I had an image. Um, so what we can do is that we will draw this image at first on the canvas. Uh, the resolution of that image is 192. Let's just know that from before. Um, so what we will do now is I want to base the position of the particle on the logo of the conference. So first I draw the logo of the conference in the top corner. Then I will get the, the image data of this part of the canvas to get access to the pixels. The image data. Uh, so I just want this small portion of the screen. Uh, that is my, my image, um, which I said above. Uh, so now I have access to a pixel buffer of the image, and I pick a random coordinate inside a small portion, and I want the index in that image data buffer. So that's uh, the x coordinate shifted by two, so it's multiplied by four without any decimal values. Um, and same in the y, but it's time the width so that it's like the, high, the y coordinate goes to the next line. So it's times rx. Uh, so when we check the data, the pixel of the logo at the index, we decided, and if, it's, if it is set, we create a particle. And if it's not, we just keep going. Um, so what did I do wrong this time? Uh, yes, of course, I forgot to get the actual data. Uh, what I was doing is that I was getting the image data, which has an object that has the width, height, and the pixel data. Uh, that's wrong. Uh, no. Okay. So now I have a logo at the top, but we want to center it. So to center this, uh, that's the, uh, the resolution of the canvas minus the resolution of the image divided by two, and then we add the coordinate inside the image to center it. There we go. So we have a logo that just like explode. Uh, and after that, we should clear the canvas by setting the, so it doesn't remain at the top. Um, it's nice, but we should actually have a little bit of colors. Uh, and I know I said that it is slow, but I, I don't have so much time. <laughs> so I will just use HSL to give some nice colors. Uh, I would like something really very saturated and not too, too bright, and whose hue depends on the time when the, 
uh, when the render loop is called. So we get something that shifts in you over time. And we can also be a little bit more crazy and add a twist with a, with a velocity to make it change the U. Um, these values are just like on top of my head, just to make it matter, to make the width and uh, the velocity matter into the hue of uh, this thing. Um, so I said also that I wanted to do something that looks a bit like the, like the wind maps that you see on the weather forecast. Uh, so we need to do that. And one common way to do this kind of thing is, uh, is to build some kind of Perlin noise. Uh, Perlin noise is basically you have noise that is very, very rough, and then you overlay like that noise at half the resolution and half the opacity several times. So we just do that. So we need like a smaller version of our canvas. Uh, so we'll say, okay, uh, yeah, this is for the vector field. Uh, so we'll say that we want uh, something that is like 11 times smaller than our canvas. So we just define a new resolution and we will draw our base noise that will be very, very random, very blank, very sharp uh, into this small version of the canvas. So we look in X, in Y. So here we will inject random values in the range of uh, 0 to 255, integer values, because RGB, the RGB notation only accepts integer values. Uh, we can do fill right at the x and y coordinate, small one. And here we can return just to get an idea of where we are. And we are nowhere, and this is great. <laughs> Line 47, sorry, comma, yes, 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 yes. Mm. Yeah, so we get very, very sharp noise, uh, but we want it full size and a bit smooth, so we will just stretch it. So you just make sure that the opacity is one, and then we'll take this small underscore rx underscore uh, underscore lowercase rx lowercase ry uh, version of the canvas into full size. So the lowercase version is the small version and the uppercase version is the full size of the canvas. So we can stretch it. And we see that it doesn't look really good. So what we need to do is basically to draw the sharp version of the noise at half the size, half the opacity on top of it itself to basically smooth it out. So this is what we're going to do just now. So we have the opacity. And uh, we'll do that, say, nine times uh, to make sure that things are really smooth. And yeah, we were doing it here. So here we take the, the canvas and the small version of it, and we want to basically downscale it by half, and then copy that half stretched and blurred on top of the original small version of it. So we will just do that below the small version of the canvas, and at half the size of a small version of the canvas to downscale it, put it somewhere else, and then we'll take this downscale version and stretch it on top of a of our sharp noise. And by doing that multiple times at half the opacity, it will just like dilute the, the noise and make it smoother. Uh, so here we copy a small version to half the size, and then we need to bring that half the size on top. So this is what we do here. Um, we can can alert to see how things evolve over time. So you see it's very sharp at the top, and slowly it gets a bit more smooth. Uh, but you see here, the bottom is, is quite sharp still. Um, there's an easy fix for that. 
we just take one pixel less. And that will do. Yeah. <laughs> so now we have something that is very close to Perlin noise in just a few lines of code. Um, now we will use this, uh, which is basically a, a smooth map of of three values that change over, over space, that change smoothly, uh, that will you represent like the wind and have the particles we move around. So now we need to use this map. First, we need to get this map. Um, and to do that, we will get the image data to get access to a pixel of this smooth map. So we get the image data of the whole thing, and that's it. So now, okay, let's see. Okay, now we have our particles just moving outward. Now we will use this vector field, this smooth RGB image, to influence the position of the velocity of the pixel. So we can do this. Uh, first, we need to know where we are inside this smooth Perlin noise thing. Uh, so we'll take the x coordinate, which multiplied by four without any integral values. Uh, because this map has RGBA values, so we need to multiply by 4 to know where we are in X and then by 4 times the width to know where we are in Y. So do this and then times. So now we know where we are inside this, uh, this vector field. So we will add this vector field to. Uh, Come on. So now we will poke into this vector field at the index value. And the, the RGB values of this vector field, it's just, it's just color. So it's from 0 to 255. And we want to move in both directions. So what we will do is just divide by 128, which is 256 divided by 2, and subtract 0 0.5. And then things will just move around. Sorry, we will subtract 1. So then we get values that are between minus one and plus one. And we just increment the index so that first, we, for the x coordinate, we poke into the r component, the red component of the blurry colors. Then we poke into the green component. So now the particles should actually start to twirl around. And you see. Um, so that's, that's quite nice already. Um, <coughs> thank you. Yep. Um, but you see that things actually get stuck in some kind of shields. Like if you think about this, uh, this blurry soup of colors uh, that we had, that we just built, if we, we think about it and put it flat and say that the colors represent shields, you see that then things can easily spin around. So what we need to do is to make the particles die after some time. And so to do that, we just, when we define the particles, we will give them a maximum lifetime, uh, which will be something like up to 300 frames. And we just say that they start at zero. So in this function where we reset the particles, we can do, uh, the current tick of a particle, if it exceeds its maximum or it comes out of the screen, then we just reset. And of course, we need to reset the now of the particle. So, yeah. Uh, so now we should get a bit less of these small loops uh, because the particle should be reset after some time. Yeah. So, Something else we can do to also bring a bit of variety, it's uh, because we have in our vector field, in our big blurry colorful image, we have three components, R, G, and B, and we only use the red here of the X and the green for the Y. We can also try to bring a bit more variety by shifting a bit between them. So we can use a yeah, small variable that will slowly shift over time just random number, no worries. Um, so what we want to do is basically to, to set a needle to say like, okay, we will shift between the R and G coordinate or the G and B 
coordinates and smoothly navigate inside this vector field of colors. Um, so we can do this. And then that's about it. So w what it does is basically a linear interpolation between two values. It's, it's nothing more than that. So this should also save us from these kind of loops that just stay here by navigating or doing a linear interpolation between the next component, then we just like escape some of these loops. Yeah. And now it's, yeah, it's time for sound. Uh, it's a bit verbose, so I saved my sanity by having a small boilerplate. Here you see a list of notes because I cannot compose music. <laughs> I'm just terrible at that. Um, so here I just create an audio context, a script processor that will uh, update a small buffer of sound, like about 8,000 values out of 44, 48,000. Um, when I just connect it, and then when we need a new sound buffer, I just get the channel data and then I will populate that. So I have a, a loop through the length of the data that I need to de generate. I say, okay, start from zero, like mute, and then I have this this T audio variable that basically says how far I am inside the sound, inside the whole sound of the whole application. But I just increment by one divided by the sample rate to, so when it reaches one, it's one second. And then I just get the BPM and the position inside the bit. Um, so we will do a simple hi-hat. So as we said, hi-hat is basically noise. Um, I will just go low for now. Okay, you can hear that? So it's just noise and it's a bit boring. So what we can do is, you could say that position in the note is uh, the BPM modulo one. So BPM. Uh, so now what I want to bring to this noise is the exponential decay that I mentioned to do. Like instead of having shh, I want to have shh. So I'll just take a position inside the one bit uh, starting from one and positioning node, and then I will go back to a power of eight. Math dot power. Yeah. So now we got this. Okay. Now let's try to add a bit of melody. Um, so we'll grab a note out of our list of notes, and we can do car add. Um, we use the position, and of course, we only have so many notes, so we just need to make sure we, we don't overflow. Um, and then we need to know the position inside that note, and for that, well, that is basically the position. <laughs> My God. Um, so, what we can do, what I would like to do is um, to use like a SOTO oscillator, so something that just goes like up and then down, up, down, up, down. And this uh, sort of oscillator is very nice because it is very rich, it has a lot of frequencies. Um, and it's basically, we take the position in the audio buffer and we multiply it by a note. But these values are very small, like from zero to five. So it's basically like a note and I need to basically say, okay, from this octave or from this range of notes. So I just multiply by uh, by big number to not start very at very bass sound. I want to go a bit higher in pitch. Uh, so we just do that. So the modulo one will basically make sure that the values are between zero and one. Like when it reaches one, back to zero, back to zero. And we add the value here. Yeah, I have a backup just in case. I'm not that crazy. So yeah, I just take the integer position and then I just use that as a not index and access the value. So what should be why is that? 
let's uh, yeah that's why that's because I'm I overwrite the sample with the hi hat. I, yeah. So now we get these notes. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's have a nice. It's not too bad. Um, and we we have access to the channel data, so we can do something very cheap. Like we can add an echo to it, and it's just taking the sound of here and like starting from a lower version of the sound of fire, just like 30% of the volume, and then on top of that we add our music. And you should start with the echo. Yeah, that was, that was a bit intense because it's very short time, um, and I hope I explained things not too bad. But you see that it's very, it's very small things, and it's just about having a, the right mindset. It's about like knowing a bit the standards, abusing them a bit, and then not being scared about math. It's just think about it as visual things, like what you represent and how you go from one thing to the other, and just. Just by thinking a little bit more visually, you, you will be able to create things and just explore and bring your ideas to life. And that's all, folks. I hope you will be... Yeah. Yeah. I hope this will inspire you, and I hope to see new cool stuff very soon. Thank you very much for having me.